A first term through a COVID-19 pandemic. Half a day, I'm Nick Delgado. This is the interview with Governor Lulian Guerrero and Lieutenant Governor Joshua Tenorio. Governor Lulian Guerrero, Lieutenant Governor Joshua Tenorio, half a day. Thank you so much for joining us here at KUAM for the interview, another round of it. First off, congratulations are in order. Thank you so much, yeah. How are we feeling and uh, have we heard from any of our challengers throughout this race? Well, you know, I actually am feeling very good about our election. I feel very good about our um, re-election and that our people have spoken and chose us to continue on in governing and leading our island in, in the next four years. And no, none of our challengers have called me or even texted me or emailed me other than what they put out in the public press. So. Uh, but, you know, we don't wait for them. We move on and work aggressively. LP? Uh, it's a very humbling experience to be reelected. Uh, the campaign was long and hard fought, but it was also very rewarding uh, being able to uh, speak to people and talk to them about our message of hope and uh, recovery, and it worked out for us. So it's been very good and uh, humbling to be in this seat. Hope and recovery is a, def a great way to put it because through most of your administration, we were in this pandemic. Uh, thankfully, we're gonna start the new year off, cross our fingers, without being in this public health emergency. So what do you both, and we'll start with you, Governor, you think stands out the most for you in dealing with the pandemic for most of this first term? Well, on the first term, of course, uh, the pandemic, the coronavirus hit our shores. Uh, we were not expecting it. And uh, I think what stood out is that we were quickly able to establish a good team of experts to guide me and also uh, a very close working relationship with the federal government, with our partners, the um, HHS, CDC, and of course the uh, White House team of experts. <clears throat> we were able, I was able to talk to them weekly and uh, use their uh, expertise for guidance throughout. But what stood out is that uh, there's no written playbook for this pandemic. And I have to say that our team did an excellent job in uh, saving and saving lives. As you know, uh, the projections were that if we didn't do anything real quickly and urgently and make the hard decisions, we could have stood to lose 3,000 people. Right now, I think we are about 470 some. Uh, I do want to tell people though that we are still um, seeing uh, positive cases out there. Although hospitalization has been very manageable, uh, the acuity of the illness is a very, very uh, moderate to mild. And so we are able to, again, uh, contain and maintain our healthcare delivery system to be able to provide uh, people with the other illnesses that they may be presenting at the ER. So um, pandemic certainly took two and a half years of our first term. Uh, and so uh, we're very excited about the next four years, I am, uh, to move again some of our initiatives and our agenda uh, in governing and, of course, providing great public service to our people of Guam. So, And, of course, our heartfelt condolences continue for those hundreds of lives that were lost and all the families impacted by this. LT, it's a much different scene from what we were seeing the past couple of years with this pandemic. We don't see a lot of the uh, testing sites and vaccination clinics that have been put in place. That's because a lot of it is more concrete at the clinics and at the hospitals. Um, how has it been for you? Right, and there's different tools, right? So, I mean, a big game changer, I thought, was uh, the tests that people were able uh, to take at home and be able to manage themselves uh, given all of the things out there. But I wanted to add that um, the pandemic tested uh, the uh, determination and the resolve of every single person on this island in the nation and the world. And throughout, we also saw a lot of frontliners 
um, do their best, but um, not be able to finish the fight. We saw that throughout the states, even here in Guam, we had yeah. folks that had been heavily involved uh, that um, took a back seat or had to do something different because uh, the stress the was the so world, great. But, you but I think that uh, one thing I have to, to say what is that, um, you know, things were tough, island, but um, we stayed very forces. focused and determined. And even though the governor was really at the pinnacle of all of the pressure, the attacks, you know, people were scared, they were angry um, about what was happening. She's going to be the number one person that takes that, but she managed to uh, remain focused. And I really think it's based on her background, her training as a nurse, being very calm in emergency situations and being able to lead our island through uh, an uncharted um, playbook, right? right? I mean, we had to create things, but using science and technology and empowering people in the community, I think that was uh, a big thing to get us going. Creating your own playbook as you had to communicate with the federal officials, the CDC, to make sure we were all on the same page to keep people right. as calm as I possible. think the other thing that showed us is how important the relationship is with the U.S. military. Mm -hmm. And it goes both ways. You know, the governor provided aid, support, and saved lives for the Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, and then, of course, the military plays a key role in logistics and transportation. Uh, and it's one of those realities that um, on Guam we always have to be cognizant of, uh, but really try as leaders to make sure that every single opportunity to maximize that relationship, we take it for the people. Yeah, and being uh, the military uh, plays a key role in providing protection and, and just the forces that they provide for this part of the world. But with the two of you being the leaders of what's called the tip of the spear, what is your plan at the local level to protect the island from our enemy forces? Well, certainly, you know, uh, we are continuously uh, providing a lot of resource and strengthening and expanding our National Guard. I am going to create a security council for our island uh, for uh, <clears throat> the next four years. And what that is, is uh, to have a council of law enforcement that would uh, be under this entity and to report up to a security council director. Uh, this was a, I think, a great idea and a recommendation by the National Security Council of the White House. And so we, I am going to uh, soon issue an executive order to stand up the Security Council. It's very important that we in the community, in the civilian, have ourselves uh, prepared and ourselves organized and ourselves coordinated with the military so that when you know threats become real and we start seeing more um, real forces um, coming this way that we can already have an organized structure to collaborate and work with the military and of course um, the Department of Defense. So the plan is that all the uh, armed forces that are here will work very closely with our uh, Security Council. Um, not that they will be reporting to the Security yeah. Council, but they would be, of course, stakeholders and uh, all our law enforcement, our police, our customs, our marshals, our uh, firemen, uh, uh, Department of Corrections, all those will be under the Security Council and we are going to be working and preparing uh, for um, you know whatever threats that we may be seeing in Guam. It's very crucial that we do that and uh, in discussions with JRM, uh, that is a great uh, idea that we will be uh, implementing in these next, I would say in the next couple of weeks. Right, and these are to establish <laughs> contingencies. These are, the Security Council is not operating um, criminal justice or any of the statutory um, areas, but it really is to coordinate and make sure that um, any time that any threat happens, um, our local people through our local law enforcement agencies in that collaboration, um, we have all sorts of contingencies mapped out. It's really uh, an effort to be very prepared. Uh, but I think the upside is we already have some good positive working relationships. So I see this being very valuable even uh, to non-threats. Uh, so and then when there's uh, there's calamities outside or a need to uh, push aid out because of natural disasters or anything, then I think this working 
relationship that is going to be able to function together, um, I think it's going to benefit the people of Guam. Pretty much to muscle up what the resources we already have in place. Guam Homeland Security already serves as one uh, voice box. When Office of Civil right. Defense, Office yes. Civil Defense. So, so the thought here, right, Nick, is that we as a civilian need to make sure that we can protect our people. The military, of course, is, is a key player. And they're going to protect their bases and they're also going to protect the civilians. So there is going to be a, a very close communication with them. We are already meeting with JRM mm -hmm. and we've had uh, a couple of meetings with the National Guard and our law enforcement to work out uh, what this evolution of this organization will be. And let me just add, one of the big uh, compelling areas is cyber. Mm -hmm. um, we know that foreign countries and foreign elements have been conducting a campaign against the U.S. its states and its territories um, looking for cyber vulnerabilities. And I think this is like the top issue that the governor is focused on because of all of the uh, things that we need to operate, our utilities, our infrastructure, um, you know, our way of life. Interesting. Can we see when that executive order is signed and see what their mission is like moving forward? And speaking of keeping the community safe, here on the ground, crime continues to plague the island just as it does anywhere else in the globe yes. and across the nation. We can't solve it alone as a government. You've right. said this before, Governor. Um, but there's a lot of concern both on the police level, from the courts level, to the attorney general's level on what the community sees as a catch and release process with these reoffenders all back in the system over and over again and just out there wreaking havoc. What's uh, your plan? Well, you know, I have uh, spoken with the attorney general and, uh, you know, he has, uh, of course, made public statements about making sure that these people are uh, incarcerated they you know he doesn't uh, agree with the catch and release I think it's a again a working together with the courts the Department of Corrections because we have to look at the facility space on uh, incarceration if there is going to be an increased number of incarceration uh, and also you know prioritizing right what the crimes are uh, are the misdemeanors and so forth going to be able to be released and is that going to continuously pose a, a threat to our community or do we prioritize it because of our limited resources to make sure that the hardened criminals are not out there uh, it's all a, uh, again, a collaborative effort. The police needs to make sure that their arrest is really tight, their evidence is really tight, so prosecution can happen. I know that the Attorney General is going to really focus on prosecution. Um, and certainly I will be supportive uh, of that because we need to make a statement out there. Now, the crimes that we see are very much as a result of our high methamphetamine addiction. And, uh, you know, there's the law enforcement part, but there is also the prevention, the education, and also the rehabilitation and the treatment part, which all together, I think, impacts on addiction. And if we can decrease the demand and decrease the supply, of methamphetamine and addiction, I think we're, we will be making a great impact in the crime because if you look at the crime, most of them are very much related to uh, drug addiction, to drugs and so forth. So we're looking at it, it's a very complex issue, I yeah. think. Uh, Josh, with his experience in the judicial court, I think provides a lot of good information and a, got a, a lot of experience and expertise in how we can uh, um, you know, have this as a one comprehensive attack and approach, right? Safety to the community is our biggest, biggest concern. Uh, I said this at the graduation of the SWAT, that, you know, every night I worry about the safety of our island. And uh, certainly we look to the police officers and the law enforcement uh, to provide that um, protection. And that's why Josh and I in our last um, four years, we're very, very much focused on making sure we retain and we recruit the people that are needed. And so we made the decision of uh, increasing salaries 
uh, providing them with all the necessary resources. So it's not really a matter of funding, Nick, or even uh, <clears throat> a matter of, it's a matter of people that are uh, very limited in coming to the call of being law enforcement officers. Uh, again, that's another issue that we will have to deal with. So um, we are attacking it in every possible facets and um, elements. And what we have with us is a very good uh, group and competent leaders in our law enforcement, uh, in our law enforcement units very much uh, passion about uh, crime. And of course, we look at various ways to stop the drugs from coming in. One of the things we did was we deputized our law enforcement and now they are inspectors in the post office. And as a result of that, we were able to confiscate over 450 pounds of methamphetamine in, in the last three, four years. So. That's a good start. Canine is another one. So we're really providing all the resources we can possibly think of to stop the uh, addiction and, of course, decrease crime. I'm going to move on and to the next question. Watch What's played your in plan essential role in the this next four years as well? I want to keep the ball rolling here, and if and how you don't mind me, I'm going to move on to the next question. What's your plans for the next four years for the new hospital campus project, and how will you ensure it continues once you leave office? Yes, of course. My plan is to continue on with um, what we are doing to, to uh, build the new hospital, mm -hmm. the complex, and it's still going to be at Eagles Field. We are right now in negotiations with the military for our lease. Uh, well, I expect to sign our lease. We had targeted for the end of this year, but we are looking at the mid middle of January. The military has been so cooperative in our um, negotiations, and I expect that to be wrapped up by the middle of this year. I mean, sorry, middle of January. And so what I want to do is first um, um, do a groundbreaking for the public health laboratory because mm -hmm. the funds are there, construction, design, and so forth is all ready to go. And then within the next uh, uh, year, I want to target at least having a groundbreaking for our new hospital because when we do that, then I know it'll continue on in the four years and of course uh, continue on in the next, next few years. Uh, I am working very aggressively and hard to make sure we we uh, build the hospital within four years. And have that property there for at least the next century, right? Oh, yes. It's, it's right. The, and so, uh, Governor, if I move on again, critics say for most politicians, the second and final term in this case for the both of you, uh, for you, is your legacy, legacy building. building. What do you hope will be Lulian Guerrero's legacy? I would hope to, uh, to have the legacy of that we uh, saved our community from a very, very, um, I think, um, tragic crisis in our in our island. And that uh, my legacy is we uh, worked it hard and we were organized, we were um, used science and data. My, I would hope my legacy to be that I had turned the government of Guam so people could trust the government and so people could depend on the public services that the government provides. Uh, and also my legacy I would hope to be is that we work very closely with our federal partners. I also want to make sure that we do the plebiscite for self-determination in these next four years. So I would like my legacy to be, wow, we have our political status, we, we have a new hospital, there's a great state-of-the-art medical complex there for the people of Guam. We built Simon Sanchez and that we are really maintaining and providing a good conducive education for our people yeah. and that our people are safe in Guam. But most importantly that we have turned around the government and now government will truly be the support for the people of Guam and that the people of Guam trust and have a good reputation of our government. It's important, Nick, that the people trust our government because I feel our government is good and I feel our government provides what's necessary to improve, enhance uh, the quality of life of our people and our families. And it's all about our families and our children. Yeah, all right, the legacy of wow, it sounds like. for. Governor a lot, Younger, right? right? I think we can do it. <laughs> yeah, we all we're, we only win. Wow, that's his, her legacy. And so moving on now to you, LT, uh, 
You'll be, will you be prepping uh, for a term of possible run for governor in 2026? And who do you think will be your primary opponents? Are we thinking who we saw in this past race? Maybe someone who's over at the legislature? Well, my first job in the next four years is making sure that uh, I'm there to get things done. All that vision that the governor has, we share that vision mm -hmm. um, of the government, of its perception, of its effectiveness, of its responsiveness, but also providing adequate um, foundations in health, safety, and education. I think that's my number one job. Um, people know me, know that I always want to be prepared. Uh, so preparing for a run for higher office is certainly something that I see myself doing um, already, um, making sure that I have all of the tools and the resources ready to mount a convincing campaign. Um, but the decision to run for office, I would say, you know, that's uh, going to be looming. It's going to be uh, influenced by the success I feel that we're going to be able to make, but it's also going to be influenced by uh, what I perceive um, the desire of Guam voters is. You know, I think that as uh, somebody running for office, you have to be very open-minded um, and also be very aware that um, there's a lot, a few more years ahead of us yeah. uh, together. And so I don't want to be, um, I'm not going to be obsessed about uh, the next election. I'm going to be very focused on what my responsibilities are today um, and in these next four years. Um, in the future, obviously, uh, the people of Guam, um, you know, have also voted for other folks that are talented um, in different uh, ways. And you just never know what's going to happen in the future. So I, I would say you always have to be kind of open minded uh, and be prepared for whatever may come. But make sure that you're not distracted uh, uh, from what your responsibilities are, because people of Guam have uh, reelected me to work for them for the next four years. Mm -hmm. And I promise you, I'm not going to let them down. I also want to add real quick that, you know, people will see the performance of the lieutenant governor. Yeah. The lieutenant governor has been very supportive with my vision and has been very supportive in what our agenda was in the, even in the first four years. We stabilized the finances, we retired the deficit, we now have surplus, and we are paying tax refunds within a week now. Unheard of. We also paid the war reparations, which was a long ongoing issue, right? Mm -hmm. So the lieutenant governor has been very supportive in my uh, work, and they will see the performance of his uh, his tenure with me in the f first four years and in these next four years, and they will have a great choice for yeah. him. All right, okay, I guess we'll ask you the question next year to <laughs> see how it goes. Final thoughts from both of you, Governor. We'll start with you. I just want to thank the people of Guam for their vote of confidence uh, in our administration. I thank the people of Guam for their patience through those hard struggles and the hard, dark days of the pandemic. And I also want to thank them, Nick, for their cooperation. Because without their cooperation and without their uh, belief that we can get out of this pandemic and work hard and follow our initiatives and our directions, we wouldn't be where we are today now, a very safe community, a vaccination rate of 92%. So in these next four years, you will see better, better work and much harder work and more effective work and much more accomplishments uh, from our office. And uh, before we leave, I just want to say Happy New Year. I am very excited that we will have a happy, healthy, and certainly a prosperous New Year. All right. Happy New Year. I just wanted to uh, say that, um, and well, let me first reflect that in this last year we've met, uh, we've lost a lot of key people. Uh, and just yesterday we lost a very key um, collaborator of ours, Dr. Margaret Hattori Uchima, who, as you know, um, works very closely with the governor on all things health and nursing. Um, and the governor and her have built the, the School of Nursing up uh, to make sure it graduates a lot of nurses to respond to healthcare. And with me, I've been working uh, very closely with her on homelessness uh, and other things with social services. Um, and so I just wanted to say, I, you know, when at the year's end, reflecting about life in the future, we never know what's ahead of us. Um, and so what I can say is that um, what we can promise to do is to just do our best. There's so many challenges out there uh, and things don't get resolved overnight. 
we have a track record of being um, unassuaged when we try and resolve something and being flexible when we need to, changing um, the strategy maybe, uh, but still keeping our eyes focused on what needs to happen. And what I can see in the next few years and this next year is really trying to work hard and collaboratively with the other sectors of the government, with the new attorney general, with the CCU, with the new board of education, you know, taking a look at um, these challenges throughout the school system with facilities, right, and making sure that um, we can try and collectively address the um, and improve the social uh, situation of the people of Guam. We have high poverty, a lot of it underlying with uh, high rates of substance abuse. We have large amounts of people that have been involved in the criminal justice system. Uh, so there are many challenges and they're very complicated, but I would say that I just want to tell the people of Guam that we're up to the challenge. And uh, every day I wake up, uh, I take my responsibilities very seriously. Uh, and I know that uh, I have uh, to meet the expectations of people that in some ways will never be satisfied, right? right? But you have to try and you have to uh, really be motivated to do something. So the, the last message I'll just say is there's a lot of people out there that, you know, are doing things in their own ways. I want to thank them, but also a lot more people that probably want to do something. And there's just so many ways to help becoming a law enforcement officer, becoming a teacher, uh, volunteering in nonprofits, giving from your pocket. Those are all ways that we can help uh, move the island forward. Uh, but I'm confident we live in a great place. Even though we have a lot of challenges, we have to be thankful that we live on this island, a very special place. Yeah, living in paradise, challenging That's work, right. challenging times ahead. We'll be there to cover it and follow it all, of course. Happy New Year to the both of you. Happy Inauguration Day. Yes. And uh, thank you for your time, Governor Luliang Guerrero, Lieutenant Governor Joshua Thank you, Nick. Congratulations on another four more years. Thank, thank you. you. KUAM will bring you the coverage of the inauguration. Happy New Year, everyone. I'm Nick Delgado. This is The Interview.